My name is Roger Palmer, and I live in Victoria, British Columbia. I'm a retired professional engineer. I spent my working career in the high-tech industry in the instrumentation, communication, and automatic identification fields. I first became involved in boating in the mid-1950s and became involved in electronics soon afterwards. In 2015, I was asked to give a presentation on electrolysis to the Royal Victoria Yacht Club, and this video is based on that material. Most boaters confuse the terms electrolysis and galvanic corrosion. However, they know that either one of them is bad news. Both of these are dependent on electricity, so we need to understand that first. So here is what we're going to talk about in this video. We'll start out by defining what electricity is, how you measure it, what the units are, where it comes from, and some useful components. Next, we'll discuss how electricity is applied on boats in typical configurations, both onshore and on board. Next, we'll get into electrolysis, what it is, how it works, what types there are, and what the effect is, and how do we circumvent it. Then we'll cover the mysterious topic of galvanic corrosion. What causes it, how do you measure it, and how do you circumvent it? We'll end up by summarizing and offering some recommendations. It's hard to describe what electricity is because you can't see it. You can only see what the effects of it are. Electricity is defined as the set of physical phenomena associated with the presence and or flow of electrical charge. An electric charge is created by the presence or absence of electrons. You might recall from high school that all matter is composed of atoms, and an atom has a nucleus, and in the nucleus there are neutrons and positively charged particles, and surrounding this nucleus is an array of orbits of electrons with negative charges. The positive particle in the nucleus is called a proton, and it has the same amount of charge but the opposite polarity as an electron. So in a stable situation, an atom has no net charge. However, if an electron is pulled away from an atom, what remains will have a net positive charge. And it's referred to, at least by electronic engineers, as a hole. Uh, we're always trying to restore equilibrium, so the electron that we removed will experience an attractive force urging it to rejoin the atom. A cloud of electrons creates a negative charge, whereas a cloud of holes creates a positive charge. Electrons would like to flow from a negatively charged area to a positively charged area in order to restore equilibrium, and the flow of electrons in a conductor creates an electrical current. The direction the electricity flows depends on your education and the context, so we will look at an example of a conductor. Imagine for the moment that this green cylinder consists of a series of adjacent atoms, each with orbiting electrons. Now we'll connect a battery to this conductor. The positive terminal is on the right. The positive polarity on the right side of the conductor will attract an electron from the atom which is right at that end of the conductor. The end atom now has a net positive charge because of the lack of the electron. That, in turn, will attract an electron to the, from the atom immediately to its left, and this process will continue right down the chain to the far end of the conductor. The flow of electricity is actually the flow of the electrons, and the electrons are moving from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal of the battery through the conductor. As the electrons move, they create holes, or absences of electrons, in the atom. And that flow can be seen to perhaps be running from positive to negative through the conductor. And that is what most people call conventional current flow. Conventional current flow, due to tradition, uh, says that electricity flows from positive to negative. But uh, physicists, scientists, and engineers know that the actual flow is the flow of electrons from negative to positive. It doesn't really matter which way it's going as long as you're consistent as you analyze any situation. The actual flow of electricity through a conductor is a little bit less than the speed of light. Good conductors, such as 
copper or aluminum allow electrons to flow quite readily. Insulators such as plastics or ceramics uh, do not allow this. Electrolytes are liquids uh, which allow electricity to flow through them. Electricity and magnetism are closely related. A current flow causes a magnetic field and a changing magnetic field causes a current in a conductor. Now to discuss measurement units for electricity. A volt is a measure of the potential difference in charge. Coulomb is a charge of a large number of electrons. An ampere, or amp, is a measurement of the flow rate of electrons in coulombs per second. And ohm is a measure of the resistance of a conductor. Now, the resistance of fresh water. Here's how it's measured. You've got two plates separated by a distance L. If the area of each plate is equal to the length, the resistance between the two end plates is about 500 ohms. This is not a good conductor. Using the same measuring technique, salt water has a resistance of approximately 0.2 ohms. Salt water is a good conductor. There is a simple relationship known as Ohm's Law, which links the fundamental measurement units of electricity. Ohm's Law can be expressed in many different forms, but the simplest form says that a voltage drop is equal to the current times the resistance in ohms. Power is measured in watts, and it's equal to the voltage times the current in amps. So as an example, if you have a 12-volt light bulb that draws 2 amps, 2 times 12 says that the power in the bulb is 24 watts. Electrical power is measured in watts. There are also mechanical and heat equivalents, as shown below. A perfectly efficient 1 horsepower electric motor consumes 746 watts, and 1 watt has 3.4 British thermal units per hour equivalent heat. Another thing to keep in mind is the conservation of energy that states that energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but it can only change its form. So let's consider an example of a stationary car at the top of a hill. Because of its height, it has potential energy. If the car then rolls down the hill, the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. If the brakes are then applied, the kinetic energy is converted into heat energy. And at all times, the total energy of the system remains unchanged. Let's now look at a simple electrical example. Here we have a battery connected via two wires to a load. Let's say the load is a light bulb. We take some measurements. The battery has 12 volts, and we only measure 10 volts at the load. But we do measure 1 amp running down the wires. So the total voltage drop through the two wires is 2 volts. And because we have 1 amp going through it, we therefore know that the wires are dissipating. 1 times 2 equals 2 watts in the form of heat and that'll be uh, equally spread between the two wires, and the wires will get warm. Meanwhile, the light bulb has one amp going through it and 10 volts across it, so 1 times 10 since that there is a 10-watt dissipation in that light bulb. Most of that will be in the form of heat, but there will be a proportion of that that goes out in light. We'll now talk about where electrical energy comes from. Many electronic devices today are powered by disposable batteries, such as alkaline AA cells. These are not rechargeable and are referred to as primary batteries. They convert chemical energy into electrical energy. Heavy consumers of electrical energy, such as boats, cars, and computers, are equipped with batteries that can be recharged. These are called secondary batteries. During a charging process, electrical energy is converted into stored chemical energy. As a battery supplies electrical current, the reverse occurs, and the chemical energy is converted into electrical energy. This round trip of charging and discharging has losses of around 30%. And this lost energy is converted into heat. The most common storage battery formulations are based on lead acid, nickel cadmium, or polymers of lithium. All batteries produced what is referred to as DC, or direct current. 
There's a positive terminal and a negative terminal on the battery. Another source of DC that's likely to be found on a boat is the photovoltaic cell, sometimes referred to as a solar cell. These directly convert incident sunlight into direct current with a conversion efficiency of uh, 10 to 20 percent, depending on the type of cell and its age. If the sun is directly overhead on a clear day, the sun is bombarding the Earth's surface with approximately 1,000 watts over every square meter of surface area. Of course, this irradiance decreases as the sun moves away from perpendicular or when clouds intervene. Photovoltaic cells are always used in combination with some type of energy storage device, such as a secondary battery, in order to provide a continuous source of electrical energy as the output of the cells vary. A source of DC that does not rely on the sun is the fuel cell. These devices combine hydrogen and oxygen to produce water in a supply of electrical energy. When comparing the electrical energy produced versus the chemical energy consumed, the overall efficiency is about 70%. This type of energy source first came into prominence during the space race in the 1960s. Today, there are portable fuel cells available that convert methanol and air into electricity, water, and CO2. The efficiencies are low, but portability and convenience is high. All of the power sources described so far produce DC, but the vast majority of the electrical power in the world today is generated by converting mechanical rotational energy into alternating current, or AC. Here is a diagram showing a magnet being rotated within a coil of wire, thereby producing a time-varying electrical voltage. This alternator could also have been constructed by using a fixed magnet and having the coil of wire rotate within its magnetic field. The instantaneous voltage produced is a function of the angular position of the coil as it rotates. For continuous rotation, this instantaneous voltage describes a sinusoidal relationship with time. The rate at which the cycles repeat is called the frequency, which is measured in hertz. The rotational mechanical energy needed to drive an alternator can come from a variety of sources, although on a boat it will usually be coming from some form of internal combustion motor. The term generator is often interchangeably used with the term alternator, but both of these devices are inherently AC. In order to charge a DC battery, diodes are used to convert the AC to DC. One of the advantages of using AC instead of DC in power distribution in onshore installations is that it is completely compatible with the use of something called a transformer. In a transformer, a coil of wire generates a varying magnetic field as a result of being driven by an AC voltage, and this field induces an AC voltage in another coil of wire, the so-called secondary winding. There is no direct electrical connection between the primary and the secondary, so the isolation is good. And depending on the ratio of turns on the primary and secondary windings, a transformer can step up or step down an AC voltage with very high efficiency. It is often necessary to convert an AC source of electrical energy into a DC supply for charging secondary batteries or equivalent. This is easily done by using diodes, which are electrical check valves. Electrical current can pass through a diode in one direction only. In the other direction, it acts as an open circuit. A single diode can be used to only allow a specific polarity of the AC signal to pass through it. Multiple diodes can be used to generate full wave rectified DC. Boats often want to have a source of AC power when they are away from the dock to run various appliances and gadgets. If the boat does not have a generator, a battery can be used to create a regular 120 volt AC 60 hertz supply using a device known as an inverter. An inverter uses transistors to synthesize a sine wave with slices of DC. A step-up transformer is used to raise the voltage. 
early inverters used a fairly simple circuit that produced what is called modified sine wave. But modern units use more sophisticated approaches to generate pure sine wave outputs that closely match the type of power available from the shore power systems. A capacitor is a two-terminal device that has no direct connection between the terminals. It consists of two conductive plates that are in close proximity and separated by material such as Teflon, plastic, or even air that is referred to as a dielectric. The electrical symbol for a capacitor looks quite similar to the actual physical configuration. A capacitor blocks the flow of a DC current but allows AC to pass with low hindrance. This hindrance is referred to as the capacitor's reactance or impedance and is a function of the size of the capacitor and the frequency of the AC. Okay, now we've finished the basic review of electricity, let's look at typical electrical systems that can be found on board boats. We'll start out by looking at a basic setup that might be found on any smaller vessel, either sail or power. We'll start out by looking at the DC section. The house battery bank is intended to provide power to various onboard loads lights, pumps, electronics, etc. during a period when the engine is not running and no shore power is available. An electrical panel containing a series of circuit breakers is used to distribute the electrical energy from the house batteries to the various loads. The house battery bank is usually 12 volts, although larger boats commonly use 24 volt systems. The house batteries must have the ability to store sufficient electrical energy to power the loads in between the times that the batteries are charged up. Battery capacity is specified in amp hours, abbreviated as AH. This number theoretically represents the product of the number of hours time the current that a fully charged battery can supply until it is totally exhausted. In practice, you never want to discharge a storage battery below 50% of its capacity. The amp hour rating of a battery is normally specified when a current is being drawn that would theoretically discharge the battery in 20 hours time. This is called the 20 hour rate. House battery banks usually consist of multiple batteries connected in parallel to achieve the desired amp hour rating. Note that all batteries must be the same type, voltage and capacity. Note that all of the loads have their common or negative lead connected to a central point in the boat called the ground bus, which is typically a strip of brass with tapped holes for lugs and screws. The ground bus is then connected to the engine block and possibly also to keel bolts and other underwater fittings. Uh, we'll discuss this later. This particular boat is equipped with an engine and a separate starting battery has been provided so that you can be confident of getting the engine started even if the house batteries are discharged. An alternator is used for charging both the house and the starting batteries. A splitter consisting of two diodes is used to allow the alternator to charge both batteries at the same time while keeping them separate with respect to discharge currents. Remember that current can only flow in one direction through a diode. Boats are often equipped with shore power systems that allow you to plug into a convenient outlet on a, on a dock and activate a series of standard AC outlets throughout the boat to power loads such as appliances, chargers, heaters, etc. A very basic shore power installation might look like this. The shore power connector has three electrical connections. They are labeled as line, this is the hot one, neutral, and ground. The color code in a shore power cord reflects this. L is black, N is white, and G is green. The ground connections on all the AC outlets are connected to a safety ground bus, which then connects to the G terminal on the shore power connector. All of the neutral connections on the AC outlets are connected to a common connection called the neutral bus, and this is connected to the N terminal on the shore power connector. Note that there must not be a connection between the safety ground bus and the neutral bus. On shore, there is a single connection between N and G, and it is at the secondary of the transformer which is feeding the dock. 
In the case of an insulation fault in an electrical appliance that would otherwise put 120 volts on the exterior metal case of the appliance, the purpose of the safety ground is to ensure that no lethal voltages are allowed to exist where a person might touch them. The safety ground continues to conduct this fault current until the circuit breaker, either on board or on shore, trips. Now, let's show both the AC and the DC wiring on this boat. Note that in this diagram, there's a green dotted line joining the safety ground bus and the boat's ground bus. It is recommended, but not required, that this connection be present, but many older boats do not have this. This connection is required if you have an inverter or generator on board. Uh, more on this later. Well, it's now time to complicate matters further by installing an inverter. This will allow you to use AC-powered devices when not plugged into shore power. Most modern inverters include what is known as a transfer switch that automatically connects the boat's AC outlets to shore power, if present, or to the output of the inverter. The inverter is connected to the boat's house battery bank, and draws current from these batteries when it is creating AC in the absence of any shore power. The transfer switch actually has three different sections. Two switch the L and N connections between shore power and the inverter, and the third connects the neutral bus to the safety ground only when shore power is not present. Note that the safety ground bus is connected all of the time to the boat's ground bus. The green wire running from the shore power's G terminal and the boat safety ground is a subject of much discussion. The red circle indicates on the diagram what it is we are referring to. When we get to our discussions of electrolysis and galvanic corrosion, it'll be realized why it might be nice not to make this connection. But there are reasons of safety why it should be retained. A good compromise is a galvanic isolator, but we'll discuss this later also. From a safety standpoint, consider what might happen if you were plugged into shore power, the circle connection to the shore power's G terminal was not present, and an AC device such as a battery charger suffered an insulation failure that connected the unit's external metal case to the 120 volt line. Because the metal case is connected to the AC safety bus, a fault current would flow into the boat's ground bus and out into the water via the underground fittings. If the fault current was less than the circuit breaker's rating, the current would continue to flow indefinitely. If the boat was in fresh water, the higher resistance of this medium would allow a large and potentially lethal to swimmers and divers electrical field to develop in the water around the boat. There have been documented cases of electrocution in this manner in fresh water. If the boat was in salt water, the low resistance of this medium would reduce the chance that this field could develop for most expected fault currents, those of less than 30 amps. I'm now going to spend some time describing the shore power system at our yacht club, which was replaced in 2014 as part of an ambitious moored rebuild program. This is typical of the system that you'll find in most modern marinas, and I want to make sure that you understand some of the issues related to grounding. Our local utility delivers 25,000 volts uh, three phase to our street. We'll just examine one phase here. At the edge of our property is a street transformer, which takes the 25 kilovolts supplied by the utility and steps it down to a more manageable 600 volts. The 600 volts then goes to the club's main electrical room where it is distributed to the various docks in our marina. Distributed amongst the docks in the marina are what are called dock kiosks, which are uh, waterproof enclosures uh, containing a step-down transformer. So the 600 volts is converted down to 120 volts. And then it is distributed through a series of circuit breakers to the actual shore power connectors, which the individual boats plug into. You'll notice that in the dock kiosk is the connection between ground and neutral. This is the only connection between ground and neutral in the system. 
There should not be one in your boat itself. The ground from all the dock kiosks and the metal enclosures and all the electrical room is connected to a single system ground, uh, which is buried into the ground in the club's electrical room. We can now complete the overall diagram by showing a boat plugged into a shore power outlet. In this diagram, everything that's located on the docks is on the left side of the drawing, the shore side. Everything on the right is what's on board a boat in terms of the AC system. Note that the only connection between neutral and ground is actually in the kiosk on the dock. The term electrolysis is often used incorrectly to describe any form of underwater metallic corrosion. There are actually two different phenomena that need to be understood. Electrolysis is defined as the decomposition of an electrolyte into its component parts via the passage of an electrical current. An example of this is the creation of hydrogen and oxygen when passing direct current through fresh water. If salt water is used, the gases produced are hydrogen and chlorine. As part of this process, metal can be eroded from one of the electrodes. Galvanic corrosion is different. Galvanic corrosion is the selective erosion of dissimilar metals that are electrically connected and submerged in an electrolyte such as salt water. We'll start our discussion of electrolysis by considering the case of passing a DC current through fresh water, as shown here. The electrode on the right of the screen is connected to the positive terminal of the battery. It's called the anode, and little bubbles of oxygen are given off by this electrode. On the other electrode, the one connected to the negative terminal, Hydrogen gas is formed. If the electrolyte is salt water instead of uh, fresh water, the anode gives off chlorine gas. The cathode still gives off hydrogen. In both of these examples, material is actually eroded from the anode and deposited onto the cathode. This particular process is used in electroplating. In industry, electroplating allows a manufacturer to deposit thin films of metal, such as copper, silver, or gold, onto other substrate surfaces. In a boat, electrolysis occurs because of stray DC current, such as a submerged electrical connection in a bilge. A common cause is faulty bilge pump wiring insulation, so we'll examine this now. Here is a typical boat which we're going to use for our example. It has an engine, a battery, and a bilge pump. And the bilge right now is clean and dry. Good situation. Now here's a more typical bilge. There's some water in it. And if that bilge pump is connected to the electrical system using just regular old crimp connectors, problems can occur. Most crimp connectors are not waterproof. Therefore, we now have a positive terminal sitting in the bilge water. The bilge water is salt, so it's conductive, and current will flow through that to the keel bolts and the through holes. The keel and the through hole are now positive with respect to the battery's negative terminal. But the negative terminal is connected to the engine and the shaft. Therefore, current will flow to the shaft and will get erosion. A more insidious problem occurs when two boats are moored nearby and both are connected to the shore power without the use of a galvanic isolator or sonar device. The shore power's ground wiring means that the electrical grounds of both boats are tied together, as shown in the diagram. The top boat is the one with a problem in the bilge. The bottom boat has a dry bilge and no problems. However, stray currents will go through the water from the keel and the through holes of the top boat to the shaft on the bottom boat through its engine to its ground wire and back up to the ground which is shared with the shore power connector of the other boat. 
The actual ground, the stake in the earth, is probably located several hundred feet away. So there's resistance in that wire and some portion of that electrolysis current will be affecting the bottom boat as well as the top boat. DC electrolysis is always caused by a DC leakage path either on your boat or your neighbor's boat if they're connected by a shore power ground path. DC leakage on your boat can be checked with a digital multimeter. Check that there's no current being drawn from the battery if everything is turned off. Then start turning on circuits one at a time to see if current starts to flow when the circuit is energized but the load is actually switched off. DC leakage that you should be worried about, which are caused by other boats, can be checked with a device such as the Marinko Galvan Alert, which is used in your shore power connection. This device measures small amounts of current in the green or safety ground wire in the power cord. Interboat DC leakage via the shore power connection can be prevented by the use of an isolation transformer or a galvanic isolator. One way to be absolutely certain that the shore power connection is not having an effect on your boat's electrolysis situation is to use an isolation transformer, as shown in the drawing above. As we learned earlier, a transformer is ideal for providing isolation because there is no direct electrical connection between the primary and secondary. The power transfer occurs because of magnetic coupling. Note that the ground connection on the shore power outlet is not even connected here. All of the AC electrical outlets have their safety ground connections tied to the boat's ground bus and hence to underwater fittings. The neutral bus is tied to the safety ground bus at the transformer. You can also use a galvanic isolator and we'll discuss that later in this uh, video. Isolation transformers are available from several different sources. They consist of iron cores and windings, therefore they're larger and heavier for higher power ratings. Uh, one exception is a unit made by Mastervolt, uh, the lower right hand part of the screen, which is a solid state system. Uh, we won't go into the details, but it results in a much smaller and lighter, but more expensive solution. Uh, other companies also offer these electronic isolation transformers. We've discussed a number of problems that seem to be centered around the issue of grounding. So do, why do we need to even have an AC sa safety ground? The issue is explained in the title itself, safety. Consider the following example. If there's an insulation failure in the heating element of the hot water tank, it is possible that the exterior metal housing of the tank could then become connected to the live AC line connection. In the absence of a proper AC ground connection, it would be possible for someone to touch the water tank while they are also touching a grounded item, such as the engine block, and receive a shock. By having a connection between the metal housing of the tank and a proper ground, either on shore and or on board, the housing will not reach a lethal voltage, and the fault current will be bypassed to ground until the circuit breaker finally trips. Homes have many areas, such as kitchens and bathrooms, where electrical devices are used in proximity to water and or grounded plumbing. Boats have galleys and heads, and bilges that are never perfectly dry, so the potential safety issues are even more severe. If a toaster or curling iron or hair dryer or electric drill fall into a sink, bilge or shower, electric currents will flow, and potentially unsafe conditions will appear. In these cases, the AC outlet should be a special type, referred to as a GFI for ground fault interrupter, or GFCI for ground fault current interrupter, or ELCI, electrical leakage current interrupter. These all work on the same principle as shown here. Under normal conditions, AC electrical current flows to the load via the L connection and returns via the N connection. These currents would normally be exactly equal. In the case of an insulation fault, some of the return current will now be via the ground wire, and the line and neutral currents are no longer exactly matched. A GFCI uses a special transformer, uh, shown as brown in the diagram, 
that detects the net difference between the L and N currents and induces a small voltage on the secondary winding. This difference voltage is amplified and then is used to trip a disconnect device. These devices trip at an imbalance of between 5 and 30 milliamps, depending on the class of the unit. Some people discuss actually cutting the green wire in the power cord. Uh, because this will eliminate the problem of uh, electrolysis with your neighbor and also eliminate the problem of uh, tripping uh, GFIs on the shore power connector. However, this is an unsafe condition. We've already uh, discussed the potential problem of an AC fault on board, a boat causing an electrical field in the fresh water near a boat that could be lethal to swimmers and divers. The conditions are these. If there is a ground fault on a piece of onboard AC equipment and the equipment is not plugged into a GFCI or equivalent and the boat's AC safety ground is not connected to the shore power ground connection either directly or via galvanic isolator, then AC currents can fl flow into the water through the immersed fittings on the boat and these currents will set up electrical fields in the water which can be fatal to divers and swimmers if the water is fresh. We've mentioned galvanic isolators several times, so it's time to go into some more detail. Galvanic isolators are devices that are placed in series with the shore power connection's ground lead. They act as an open circuit for voltages of less than about plus or minus one volt, but act as a short circuit for higher voltages, thereby continuing to provide protection under AC fault conditions. Galvanic isolators use diodes. You'll recall that a diode allows electric current to flow in one direction only. When conducting current, a diode has a voltage drop of just over one half a volt. So a series parallel configuration of four diodes, as shown here, will act as an open circuit for voltages of less than approximately plus or minus one volt. But it will act as a conductive path for higher voltages. If a galvanic isolator is put in series with the shore power connection's ground lead, it will act as an open circuit for small voltages that might be caused by electrolysis, either on board your boat or a neighbor's, while providing a conductive path for any fault currents that might occur. They come in many sizes and shapes. The diagram here shows where the galvanic isolator is normally installed. Some AC-powered electrical devices on board boats have high-speed digital switching circuitry or filters that create a small amount of AC current in their ground connections. Concern has been expressed by some that these small AC leakage currents can cause a diodes in a galvanic isolator to conduct some of the time, thereby eliminating the isolation properties of the device. Because of this, so-called fail-safe galvanic isolators include a capacitor in parallel with the diodes so that AC current bypasses the diodes. This is recommended by the American Boat and Yacht Council, and many manufacturers have adopted this policy. But not everyone agrees that this is either necessary or a good idea. This is another one of those controversial topics. The electrolysis discussion so far has been discussing stray DC currents originating on board your boat or your neighbors. But what about stray AC currents originating on shore or on board? Very little has been published on this topic. An extensive literature search and numerous discussions with experts all over North America led me to conclude that AC electrolysis exists but it is much less damaging than DC electrolysis. So the question is, how much less damaging? No one can answer this question definitively, so I decided to do a series of experiments to come up with my own estimate. I wanted to be able to compare the rates of DC and AC electrolysis to get a feel for the issues. I used a series of brass fittings for the tests which were conducted in a plastic container filled with salt water taken from the Oak Bay Marina. The brass fittings each had a surface area of six square inches immersed in the water. The tests were started using AC 
and the voltage was adjusted until one amp of current was passing through the system. Things progressed surprisingly slowly. Minimal bubbling or water discoloration, and no initial erosion of the metal. After 24 hours, the surface of the brass had a definite discoloration, but it still felt fairly smooth while dragging a fingernail across it. After five days of one amp AC, the surface of the water around the electrodes had obvious discoloration, and the brass fittings exhibited some pitting and surface roughness. This AC test was stopped after five days. New electrodes and new salt water were then employed to do the same test using one amp of DC current. Things happened much more rapidly with the DC test. As soon as DC power was applied, bubbling was seen and heard, especially around the negative electrode. These were presumably hydrogen gas bubbles. The DC test was stopped after four hours, and the electrodes were examined. The positive electrode exhibited a very rough surface. Based on this test, it is estimated that one hour of DC electrolysis caused as much erosion as five days of AC electrolysis at the same current. This implies that AC electrolysis is approximately one one-hundredth as damaging as DC electrolysis. Note that these tests were just looking at the point where metal corrosion became visible and could start to be noticeable with a fingernail. Subsequent discussions with the head technology manager, a major manufacturer of marine electrical equipment, suggested that under some conditions the difference may be even ten times larger. We will therefore go out on a limb and declare that DC electrolysis is between 100 and 1,000 times as damaging as AC electrolysis. It would be good to know what tolerable levels of leakage current are, and we can use these previous experiments to estimate this. A typical 33-foot sailboat might have a propeller that's 14 inches in diameter and has two blades. The total area will be approximately 100 square inches of blades and hub. From these experiments, we estimate that the first visible signs of physical uh, electrode erosion occurred after 10 to 15 minutes of 1 amp DC current. Based on the area and the time, we can say that the exposure when this erosion first appeared was about 0.035 amp hours per square inch. Therefore, we would need a DC leakage exposure of about 3.5 amp hours before the first signs of metal erosion become visible on the propeller. Note that this assumes that the only underwater object is the propeller. It ignores the shaft, strut, and any other connected underwater electrical components. If there was a continuous DC leakage current of 5 milliamps, we would reach this exposure level after about one month. Assume for the moment that AC electrolysis is 100 times less damaging than DC. This means that we would see the same level of damage to the 14-inch propeller after one month's continuous exposure to 500 milliamps of AC, or one year's exposure to 40 milliamps. There are a lot of approximations and assumptions in this analysis, but it gives us a feel for the magnitudes of leakage current that can be problematic. Right after our Yacht Club's new electrical system was installed in 2014, rumors started to circulate that there was excessive AC leakage current. One afternoon in November 2014, we used a clamp-on ammeter to check the leakage current on the shore power cable of all 300 boats in the marina. Here are the results. At the time of the test, we didn't know which boats were equipped with galvanic isolators and whether or not they had capacitors, the so-called fail-safe design. We therefore made up a simple two-diode galvanic isolator for testing purposes and installed it in a pigtail cable that could be put in series with the boat's power cord. Using this pigtail galvanic isolator, we retested all the boats that had previously exhibited leakage currents of over 30 milliamps and observed that the leakage current was reduced to virtually zero in every case. 
Discussions with the owners of some of the boats exhibiting high AC leakage currents indicated that they already had galvanic isolators installed. Subsequent investigation showed that these isolators were of the type that had a built-in capacitor. So from an AC standpoint, they were acting almost like short circuits. We then talked to the owners of a couple of the boats exhibiting no AC leakage. It turns out that these boats had fairly basic AC systems and did not have inverters. They also met at least one or more of the following criteria. No connection between the AC safety ground and the boat ground, an older galvanic isolator without a capacitor, or no connection to the shore power ground wire. At the end of this video, there's a link which will allow you to download a set of notes to accompany this uh, particular presentation. Uh, there's a lot more detail in these notes, and in particular, uh, there are details as to how we determined where this AC leakage current was originating. The end determination was that it was actually starting on shore. You'll recall this diagram from earlier in the presentation. It shows the AC configuration of the marina. You'll note that there's only one ground on this diagram. It's the system ground located in the foreshore electrical room, and it is a post driven a long way into the earth itself. And it provides the ground not only for the boats, but also for quite a bit of other electrical equipment in the foreshore area. It turns out that the other equipment, which was sharing the system ground, was actually injecting quite a bit of AC current into it, as shown by the upper pink arrow. As a result of this current, the ground rod is not actually at zero volts or ground uh, potential. It is elevated slightly because of the resistance of the contact to the earth. And it's elevated at about uh, almost one-tenth of a volt AC. And that one-tenth of a volt AC, of course, elevates the ground connection on all the uh, power cords on the docks. In this diagram, the four boats represented on the right side of the diagram which are connected to the ground system, will have to share some of the ground current out into the water through their propellers and shafts. The top boat has no connection to the ground and therefore has no AC leakage current, although it does have a safety issue. In this diagram, two of the boats have galvanic isolators installed. The top one is a conventional non-failsafe unit and you'll see that it has completely stopped the AC leakage current. The one that's underneath it is a modern fail-safe uh, galvanic isolator. You can see the capacitor in parallel with the diodes. And because of the capacitor, the leakage current still goes through into the engine, shaft, and propeller. The bottom two boats are unchanged in this diagram. Unless your boat has an isolation transformer, a galvanic isolator in the ground lead is almost essential. However, if you're worried about AC leakage current or AC electrolysis, you might want to choose a standard galvanic isolator that does not have a capacitor. As described earlier, electrolysis is caused by an external energy source, such as a battery or shore power. We're now going to discuss galvanic corrosion, which does not require an external source of electrical energy. Galvanic corrosion occurs when two dissimilar metals are joined electrically and both are immersed in an electrolyte, such as water. Galvanic corrosion is caused by a flow of DC current which originates in the metals themselves. Note that both electrolysis and galvanic corrosion result in the erosion of metal. Any metal submerged in an electrolyte, such as seawater, develops an electrical voltage known as the standard electrode potential. 
sometimes referred to as a self-potential or freely existing potential. This is due to interaction of the electrons on the surface of the metal with the electrolyte's ions. This voltage potential is different for different metals and their alloys. If two different metals are submerged in seawater, there will be a voltage difference between them. This is actually creating a basic form of a primary battery. If these two electrodes are now connected together with a wire or some other conductive path, current will flow and one of the electrodes will suffer erosion. Note that if the two electrodes are touching each other, current will flow across the junction and erosion will occur on the exposed surface of one of the electrodes. Determination of which electrode gets eroded has to do with the relative nobility or activity of the metals used in the two electrodes. The most active electrode, that is, the one with the least nobility, will be eroded. This is the one whose self-potential is the most negative. The relative nobility or activity of two metals can be determined by looking at their relative positions on the galvanic table. The order of the materials in the chart that is shown here is based on the freely existing potential of each metal. It is relatively easy to measure this potential by using a digital voltmeter and a reference electrode. There are several different reference electrodes that are used in the field of electrochemistry, but the most common one used for marine applications is referred to, because of its composition, as a silver slash silver chloride reference electrode. Here is a typical silver silver chloride electrode together with a digital voltmeter. Using this equipment, you can determine the freely existing potential of any material, which should fall into the ranges shown on this chart. On boats with conventional inboard engines and shaft configurations, most galvanic corrosion problems occur when a bronze propeller is fitted to a stainless steel shaft. Referring to the chart, we can see that bronze has a potential of about minus 0.3 volts, and stainless steel has a potential of about minus 0.07 volts. Because the two materials are in electrical contact, the bronze propeller, being the most active, will be eroded, and some of its metal will actually be plated onto the shaft. Over a period of time, considerable damage can occur to a propeller. To protect expensive propellers, a sacrificial anode can be mounted on the shaft in such a way that it makes electrical contact. This sacrificial anode must be less noble than bronze that it's protecting. The sacrificial anode is eroded, thereby protecting the bronze propeller and the stainless steel shaft. Looking at the galvanic table, Almost any metal located below bronze could be used as a sacrificial anode, but in practice, the two most commonly used materials are zinc and aluminum. Indeed, a common term for a sacrificial anode is the word zinc. Metal hulled boats often have sacrificial anodes welded directly to the hull, while smaller boats use anodes that are clamped via bolts to the components that they are to protect. Here's a photo of a steel-hulled boat using large zincs welded onto the keel to protect the hull, plus a zinc mounted on the shaft nut to protect the propeller, and a smaller zinc bolted onto the steel rudder. For protecting aluminum, especially in fresh water, magnesium anodes are sometimes used because of their very low potential, less than minus 1.6 volts. Aluminum anodes are often made from a special aluminum alloy composed of aluminum, indium, and zinc. These have a longer service life than pure zinc anodes and are also sometimes used with aluminum outdrives and sail drives. Some companies offer proprietary formulations such as galvalum or navaloy that are optimized for specific marine galvanic protection applications. A sacrificial anode must show signs of erosion to confirm that it is working properly. If an anode looks almost new after several months of use, it's not doing anything. 
This is probably due to a poor electrical contact with the item to be protected. Anodes should also not be painted. Some boat owners do not like to have permanently fitted sacrificial anodes, but instead prefer a temporary arrangement whereby an anode is fixed, mechanically and electrically, to a wire hung over the side of the boat. The wire must be firmly attached to the boat's ground system, or perhaps directly to the shaft if it is easily accessible. If too small an anode is used, its surface area may have a difficult time overcoming the potential of the least noble item to be protected. If too large an anode is used, it is possible that paint blistering might occur, and wooden boats will suffer wood damage around the through hull fittings if they're connected electrically to the shaft. In order to ensure that there is adequate protection, a silver chloride reference electrode and digital voltmeter can be used. Connect the voltmeter between the reference anode, suspended over the side within 5 or 10 feet of the propeller, and a good connection to the boat's ground. Unplug the shore power, turn off all DC loads. And this test should be done after the boat has been sitting stationary for at least 8 hours. The voltage you read will be the net effect of the sacrificial anode and the various underwater metals to which it is attached. A larger surface area on the sacrificial anode will result in a more negative voltage on the digital voltmeter. As an absolute minimum, there needs to be sufficient anode area such that the net voltage displayed is at least quarter volt more negative than the freely existing potential, as determined from the chart, of the least noble material to be protected. This does not apply to the protection of aluminum components. The voltage that is measured using this technique is sometimes referred to as the hull potential. As a rough guide, the hull potential should fall into the ranges shown here on the screen. Getting more precise, the recommended hull potential for a fiberglass boat with an inboard engine and conventional shaft or prop is minus 750 millivolts to minus 1000 millivolts or minus one volt. For a fiberglass boat equipped with a sail drive, outboard, or stern drive, the hull potential recommendation is minus 900 millivolts to minus 1050 millivolts. For an aluminum hull, the recommended hull potential is between minus 800 millivolts and minus 1100 millivolts. As mentioned previously, you don't want to overprotect by using too large a sacrificial anode. Problems can occur with wooden hulls, paint can bluster, and it can actually reduce the effectiveness of some anti-fouling paints. Unless an isolation transformer or galvanic isolator is installed, you should be concerned about boat-to-boat -boat galvanic corrosion due to the shore power connection. Looking at this drawing, you can see that the green shore power safety ground is connecting the engine blocks of both of these boats together. If only one boat has a zinc on its shaft, that zinc will be eroding to protect the propeller and drive shaft of that boat as well as the propeller and drive shaft of the neighbor's boat. Although neighborly, this will result in a higher than usual consumption of zinc on the one boat. The addition of a galvanic isolator or an isolation transformer ensures that your sacrificial anode protects your boat and not your neighbor's. Your neighbor is going to have a corrosion problem unless he invests in his own anode. Protection from galvanic corrosion can also be provided by a modern impressed current cathodic current protection system. This is usually referred to as an impressed current system, and an electronic controller monitors a reference electrode to determine the hull potential, and then generates a DC output which goes to a platinum anode, which then provides protection to the propeller and the shaft. The platinum anode does not erode. This particular system is used with many large commercial ships, oil rigs, and pipelines that don't rely on sacrificial anodes. The advantage of this system is that there's no need to replace a consumable sacrificial anode, 
and it is easy to adjust the protection parameters over a large area, perhaps over the length of a pipeline, from one location. The disadvantage is one of cost and the fact that electrical power is being consumed, potentially draining a battery. Some manufacturers of stern drives, sail drives, and pod drives offer small impressed current systems to protect their delicate aluminum structures. It's important to follow the manufacturer's recommendations exactly. Recall that galvanic corrosion requires two dissimilar metals in electrical contact. Well, supposing you only have one piece of metal, it's all the same. Can it corrode? Maybe. Local impurities, defects, welds, or variability in the electrolyte oxygen content can cause different potentials to occur at locations on the surface of the metal, leading to galvanic corrosion. This corrosion can be prevented by using sacrificial anodes or impressed current systems. Consider the steel pilings in most marinas. They sound like they're just a single piece of steel, but local defects can still cause galvanic corrosion. Many marinas which use steel pilings protect them by hanging zincs connected to a cable that is electrically bonded to the piling itself. Metal rudder posts and shaft struts also need to be considered in this regard. Seacocks definitely need some type of protection because internally they contain different materials, usually bronze and stainless steel. The extreme tips of manganese bronze propellers, which are made of copper, manganese and zinc, often exhibit a pink color. This is because the higher water velocity at the tip creates a different galvanic potential in its bronze, and a galvanic reaction is set up that slowly depletes the zinc content, leaving an appearance that almost looks like it was caused by cavitation problems. Note that this is not a problem with propellers fabricated from Nebral, which is an alloy of nickel, bronze, and aluminum. A boat that uses a bonding system uses internal wiring, often copper strap, to connect all the underwater fittings and shaft to a large zinc that is often located in an area where its condition can be easily checked from the dock. It also protects otherwise isolated through hulls. The many connections need to be inspected regularly. Here are some photographs of a boat with a bonding system. Connecting a bonding system to the shaft and propeller uh, can be problematic. So some boats use brushes which actually wipe on the shaft and electrically connect to the bonding system. However, the resistance through these is higher than you might like, so it still might make sense to put a protective anode on the shaft or the propeller nut. It's now time for the summary and some recommendations. First of all, for onboard 120 volt AC systems, Number one, keep the wiring out of the bilge. If there is no inverter or AC generator, the AC safety ground does not need to be connected to the boat's ground bus, although it is recommended. If there is an inverter or AC generator, the AC ground must be connected to the boat's ground bus. There is a possible electrocution hazard for swimmers or divers in the case of a ground fault if the boat is in fresh water and there is not a good connection with the shore power's ground connection, the so-called green wire. If the AC safety ground is connected to the boat's ground bus, the shore power's ground connection, the green wire, should be connected to the AC safety ground either via an isolation transformer or a galvanic isolator. A direct connection will work from a safety standpoint, but opens a door to possible boat-to-boat -boat issues with both electrolysis and galvanic corrosion. Some terminology differentiation. Electrolysis is caused by leakage currents and can affect similar submerged metals. Galvanic corrosion is caused by submerged dissimilar metals in electrical contact. Electrolysis requires an external source of current Galvanic corrosion does not. Okay, on to DC systems. Number one, keep the wiring out of the bilge. 
The boat's ground bus should be connected to the engine block and possibly also to all the other components in contact with the water if a bonding system is installed. Check for leakage currents inside the boat. If a shore power system is also present, make sure that the ground connection, the green wire, from shore is not directly connected to the boat's ground by using an isolation transformer or galvanic isolator. Considerations for galvanic corrosion. A shaft sacrificial anode or an impressed current system should be installed. Alternatively, a suspended zinc that is firmly attached electrically to the boat's ground can be considered. Use a reference electrode and digital voltmeter to confirm the adequacy of the protection system. Worry about unprotected but homogeneous submersed metallic components such as rudder posts, shaft struts, and through hulls. Consider the use of a bonding system. Check the rate of erosion of the sacrificial anodes. If they're not eroding, they're not protecting. Well, we got through a lot of material. I hope you found it useful. There is a set of printed notes available as a downloadable PDF file. The notes have 43 pages and cover several aspects of these topics in more depth from the video. The notes can be found at the following URL, www.paltech.ca forward slash electrolysis underscore seminar underscore notes dot pdf. Remember, keep the wiring out of the bilge.